All right, so we are on this network now where we're going to look at CDP. So uh, before we go into it, uh, I just want to um, reiterate that CDP is about Cisco devices. And there are a few devices or other vendors that they have licensed it to. Right? Um, so <clears throat> when we use this network, we will not be able to collect CDP on the computers right? because they are not Cisco devices. So any information we collect will be about the switch, these two switches, and the router. <clears throat> Right, because those are the Cisco devices. Alright, so with that said, let's take a look. So we have um, gone on switch 2. Notice in this case, so they have not showed us the, how they have configured CBP, right? And that is why I went in and showed us and, and did it before, right? So we'd have to do the CDP run to turn it on globally on the switch or go on each interface and say CDP enable. Right? So whichever method CDP has now been turned on and so we can go on the switch in this case and say show CDP neighbors. It is switch 2 so I'm going back to the diagram so this is switch 2 right here so, given that CDP is able to show us directly connected devices, we should be able to see switch 1 and also R1. So, down here, it gives us the capability codes. So, anything that is listed with an R is going to be a router, and anything listed with an S is going to be a switch. So, um, down here now, we have these headings, device ID, local interface, that's what this really means, old time, capability, platform, port ID. So, one, two, three, four, five, six headings. Under the device ID, what we see here is the names of the devices. Now these are the host names. <clears throat> so whatever host name that was given to a device, CDP is able to collect that. So it collects the host name, SW1. The local interface here is the interface on switch 2 where that information comes in. Okay. So local interface is the interface on the device that you're using where the CDP information came in. I'm going to go back to the diagram. So this is the interface. So we're on switch 2 and this is the interface. You can be Ethernet 1 slash 0 slash 21. This is it. Give it Ethernet. 1 slash 0 slash 21 is the local interface. It is the interface on the device that you are currently connected to. Then we have the whole time. This is, remember, uh, we have seen it being 180 seconds. So R2 will hold the information it receives for 180 seconds. What this 155 is saying is in 155 seconds are remaining out of the 180. Right? So since it has received this information, 155 seconds is now remaining out of the 180 seconds. Then under capability, we see S and I. So S means it's a switch, so it's telling us the device that we receive the information from is a switch, and then I means IGMP, which means the device supports IGMP. 
IGMP is Internet Group Management Protocol. It is really a protocol that supports the multicast function. So what we know is that connected to a port once a gigabit Ethernet 1 slash 0 slash 21 is a switch that supports multicast. Then the platform tells us the exact type of switch. It's not just a matter of any switch. It's a, a work group switch and um, the physical platform is a 2960. Right? So we know the exact type of switch. The port and the switch that is sending us the information. So this port here is the port on switch 1, SW1. I'm going back to the diagram. SW1, this is the port. So this is the port that is sending the information to SW2. Give it Ethernet 1 slash 0 slash 24. Alright, going back to the show command. You give it Ethernet 1 slash 0 slash 24. That makes sense? Yes, sir. Okay, good, good. And then we get similar information for the router. Right? So the rest of it, we're, we're pretty clear on what each item means, right? So I'm just going to zero in on this part here that here is a link. And the capability, it says RSI. Right? So R is a router, S is a switch, and I is an IGMP. So if we're saying that that device has the routing functionality, it has switch functionality and it has multicast functionality. So it, it's it's basically like a layer three switch. Then over here, the platform it's C one 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 dash eight p. So this is the type of physical configuration of the router. So you see, just by collecting the CDP information, we have learned a lot about two devices within the network. And this is why it, it can turn out to be a security risk. And moving on. So in this case, the command is show CDP neighbors detail. So this now will allow us to see all the neighbors and further detail. Notice everything on this page is about SW1. All right, so switch 2, as we have run the command on switch 2, and everything that it collects on this page is, is about SW1. So here is what we have learned about SW1. We have learned the IP address. It has an IP address of 1.1.1. The platform, it's a Cisco workgroup switch, uh, C2960. The XR-24T, which, which tells us that it is a 24 port switch. Okay. We know that it's a switch that supports IGMP, which is multicast. Interface that we have received the information on. The port on the switch that, that is sending the information. This time the whole time is at 144 seconds, which is saying we switch two will hold this information for another 144 seconds. We have learned the version of the iOS. So this now is the actual software, the operating system running on Switch 1. Right? It is C2960X Universal K9-M. So we know the exact operating system. This, by, by this operating system, we know that 
the K9 here tells us that it supports advanced uh, encryption. Right? And the M here tells us the, 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 what they call the build of the operating system. And the build mean maintenance. Um, so the operating system, um, based on the build, it has a certain amount of uh, um, support life. Right? So the, the support life could be 24 months or 18 months. Um, so by knowing that it is a maintenance build, we could go and check on um, Cisco's website and see maintenance build has uh, what, uh, main, what uh, support lifespan. So we could get an idea as to whether or not, well not whether or not, how long this operating system will continue to be supported. We know the version of the operating system, it is version 15. So we have learned quite a bit about SW1. Going further, we down here know that this operating system was compiled on, uh, on the 13th of September 2018. So by using this and then knowing the support um, lifespan, we could tell the, 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 the date when this will no longer be supported. Down here now is about uh, um, more about uh, CDP, it's version 2. Right? It, uh, it is sent out hellos. Um, the switch that we have collected information from has a VTP management domain of FRED. Now VTP is a part of VLAN, right? VTP is VLAN trunking protocol. So we know that the domain there is called FRED. We know that switch one is using VLAN one as the native VLAN. We know that the port that we have connected to is a full duplex port. And we know that if we are to do management, we are to log into the switch to management, we can use the IP address of 1.1.1. One one one. So, as you see here, a, a ton of information about a switch that we have not connected to. We have not even seen it, but we know all this about it. Yeah, it's kind of startling, you know? Yeah. And this is why we say it could be a security issue, right? Definitely. Yeah. All right, moving on. So this is looking at similar information now that it is collected from the router. So we see the IP address of the router, platform, capability. It can do routing, switching, and multicasting. Uh, down here. We see the iOS um, software, uh, uh, Fuji. It's an ISR router, which is an integrated services router, which tells us this gives us an idea of the, how, how lately the router was built. Because the ISRs came in like about seven years ago. So we know we could consider it a fairly recent router. The operating system is a ARM eh ed underscore Linux iOS D, so we know it's a Linux based iOS and it's also supporting user universal K9, which the K9 tells us um, advanced encryption and again it's a maintenance build. It is version 16 of the iOS. And uh, we know when it was built. Uh, Tuesday, the operating system was compiled Tuesday, the 27th of March 2018. So, that's how um, detailed the CDP information can get.
right so other commands that we can use show cdp which i had shown you this one it it, it, it will tell us like the, the, the how frequently the cdp information is sent what is the whole time and what version so that's the three pieces of information show cdp gets us the frequency at which cdp is sent the default is 60 seconds the whole time which is defaulted to 180 seconds and also the version and um, version latest version is version 2 show cdp interface which is a way of getting the um, it says states whether cdp is enabled on each interface and then show cdp traffic which lists global statistics for the number of CBT, CBP advertisement sent and received. So here is the show CDP. We have seen this. I, I, this is the one I did on um, the router. And then we have the show CDP interface. We did Ethernet 1 slash 0 slash 2, and uh, that gives us the whether or not CDP is enabled on the interface. So it tells us the interface and whether or not the interface is up. The encapsulation is up, and it says sending CDP packets every 60 seconds, and the whole time is 180 seconds. An uh, interesting thing to point out here, which really has nothing to do with CDP, but it's good to know. Encapsulation ARPA, this really means Ethernet. So anytime you see encapsulation ARPA, it means Ethernet. So the port is using is an Ethernet port. Okay. If I will add resolution, okay. ARPA is an Ethernet. Okay. Yeah. ARPA is actually... Um, not address resolution protocol. It's um, mm, uh, I can't remember what it has to do with the initial development of um, of, of of networking. Yeah, Advanced Research Project Agency Network. So this is the group that was formed back in 1969 to build out um, networking technologies. The military group, yeah. Yeah. Um, you might also see DARPA, which is the department. So you just put department at the beginning. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, so the next one is show CDP traffic, and in this case, now what we get is statistics on the CDP traffic. I mean, CDP packets that have been sent. So it says total packets output is two hundred and four, input two hundred and five. So this switch that we are on has sent out 204 CDP packets and it has received 205 CDP packets. Um, hardware syntax, zero of them have had any hardware syntax issue. Checksum error, zero of them had checksum error and so on and so on. So this is really whether the issues, if there were issues with them, right? Um, note here, CDP version 1 advertisement output 0 and input 0, so we know we're not using version 1. Down here, CDP version 2 advertisement output 304, input 305, so we know we're using version 2. See that? Yes. Okay. Alright, so that was CDP. So the other option is LLDP. 
if you are running a network where you have Cisco devices and you have devices from other vendors, they say you had some Avaya switches, you had some um, Juniper routers, um, you had some Alcatel routers as well, then uh, CDP will not help you very much because it's only for the Cisco devices. So you may want to use LLBP that works on every device. It works very similar. It is still, uh, it is also just like CDP. It's a um, directly connected uh, protocol. It only gets information on directly connected devices. So it will show LLBP neighbors and then it has the capability codes as well. So R is for router. So now the information is not, not much different, right? What it says device ID R1 for the router, which is the host name, then local interface, which is the interface on switch two, then whole time, which is 120. The whole time is, is the same um, 180 seconds, right? Which means it will keep the information for 180 seconds. Capability R, so we know it's a router, and then port ID. This is the interface and switch one that is receiving the information. Sorry, yes, interface and switch one, actually, but it's not, not receiving, that is sending the information over to a switch. Two. Okay. Notice for switch. It says B, which is bridge. Right? So LLDP does not have a code for switch. Their code is for bridge. But of course, as we know, a switch and a bridge is very, very similar. So instead of having something there for a switch, let us use B for bridge, and that would cover whether it's a a native bridge or a, or, a, or a switch which works like bridges. S for them is for station, meaning it's a, like a normal computer. See that? Yes. Right. So what we're doing here is making a comparison. So we do show LLDP neighbors, comparing it with the show CDP neighbors, just so that we can have an idea of how, how similar the information is. As you can see, the, the difference comes right here, capability and platform. So LLDP gives us capability, but it tells us less information. The CD, CDP can tell us um, not just that it's a switch, but that it also support IGMP. While for um, for for LLDP, it just tells us B for bridge. Notice also for CIS or CDP, it says switch. And in their capability codes, they actually have a B for bridge. So they can tell a Cisco bridge different from a Cisco switch. But LLBP would not be able to do that. LLBP would only know that it's a bridge, which, which, which covers both switches and bridges. With me on that? Yes, so any other switch will basically call the same thing. Correct. So the, the detail under this section is a little less, but it's still going to be helpful. Right. It doesn't get us the platform, so we don't know what operating system or what type of switch or what type of router is there. We just know that it's a switch or a router. So we have our show LLDP entry, 
and then we put the name R1 to indicate which device we want to get the entry off. Right, we could have had the same show CDP entry R1. So comparison. Um, let me just check something. Oh, I was hoping they would have had the comparison, but we can go back up to make the comparison. In other words, if I go to um, Oh, they actually didn't, uh, they had used the show CDP neighbors detail, but this is the same information you'll get with the show CDP entry. So, if we're comparing anything, we'll compare this information, right, this show CDP neighbors detail information with the show LLDP entry, right here. Alright, so as we see, it um it tells us interface local interface uh it tells us the interface and the firing switch um we get a, a description right, of the interface you get it internet um zero zero one we know that the interface is coming from a device um, with a host name of R1. Now inside here we get a little more detail. This is where we get uh, the iOS. So we see the actual iOS. So we could still use LLDP to get the iOS but uh, only using show LLDP entry. Now down here, system capabilities, we see that it has the bridge and the routing functionality. However, it is telling us that it's only the routing functionality is actually turned on. So in other words, it's not operating as a bridge, only operating as a router. We get the IP address. Right, so um, quite a bit of information still, right? a little less than what we would get from CDP, but uh, uh, still, still enough to be dangerous. See that? Yes, yes. So similar to how we could turn on CDP for the globally on the device or turn it on on ports, we can do it, do it with LLDP. So if you want to turn on LLDP on the entire switch or the entire router, we will do LLDP run. So that turns it on on every port. We can then go to individual ports and turn it off. So in this case we are turning it off and put it within it one slash zero slash seventeen. And I'm saying no LLDP transmit, no LLDP receive. And on interface gigabit internet one slash zero slash eighteen, we say no LLDP receive. So it's going to work on every other port except the these that we have turned it off on. That makes sense? Yeah. Now in this case, what we are doing, we did not turn it on globally. Notice we did not have the command LLDP run. So we did not turn it on globally, we just go to these individual ports and turn on LLDP. So it's going to work only on these two ports and on no other port. Right, so that's similar to how CDP operate. We could use the command show LLDP and it tells us LLDP advertisement says every 30 seconds. So this is twice as fast as CDP. CDP sent every 60 seconds. Or, or LLDP is being sent every 30 seconds. 
here we see the whole time is 120 seconds I remember the whole time on CDP was 180 seconds uh, LLDP interface reinitialization delay is 2 seconds so this is um, the you know, I'm not so sure what this reinitialization delay is. Um, I know they didn't want us to zero in on it, but let's, let's see if we can find out exactly what that is. Okay, all right, I get it. All right, so um, let's say the whole time expire, right? LLDP should uh, reinitialize. In other words, it should do uh, reset all the information it has, um, and then. Uh, start to collect new information if there's no information then you just simply just dump everything but rather than do that right at the 120 seconds it waits an additional two seconds right? the, the reason for that is just in case information comes in at that two second point where it doesn't have to then dump all of what it has and start over right so it it, it gives the the router or switch, whatever the device, the ability to not have to reset itself um, too quickly. Right? It gives it the additional two seconds wait to say, okay, let's just, just wait two more seconds to see if anything will come in. With me? That makes sense? Yes, that's fine. Yeah. It's like you say, you're supposed to meet somebody at 5 o'clock, and but you're going to give them a, a, a two minute thing. So when 5 o'clock comes, you're just not going to just walk away if you don't see them. You're just going to give them an additional two minutes. Yeah. Yeah. Alright, so the next command here is show LLDP interface. So you can see you now LLDP status on an interface. So it tells us transmit enable, which means it is um, sending out LLDP information on the interface. Receive is enabled, so it is receiving um, on the interface. Transmit state idle, um, which means it is currently not transmitting. So even though it was it is set to transmit, right now it's not transmitting anything. Meaning it is going to be within this 30 second period because it's transmitting every 30 seconds. So we know it would have transmitted at some point and now inside the 30 seconds window. And then receive state, wait for frame. So again, wait for frame here is saying it is within the 30 second window but waiting now for uh, uh, LLDP frame to, to come in. show LLDP traffic so this is similar to the C show CDP traffic so we see the total frames that have been sent 259 total frames that have been received 257 
And that's our last slide in this pack. Alright. So that's LLDP. Alright, so we're going now to network address translation. Before we move on, any questions? <laughs> Sir. No, none so far. Okay. Alright, so network address translation. Alright, so um, network address translation deals with um, scalability issue. In other words, it allows to be able to um, not run out of IP version 4 addresses. Um, so that's one of the things we'll talk about. Um, the, the concept of what exactly uh, or how exactly it works and then we're going to talk about the configuration and troubleshooting of network address translation. So before we actually look at network address translation we have to take a look at what scenario would have us need to use network address translation and uh, this is uh, where it is mostly used. These routers here are showing routers, uh, um, the internet facing routers of organizations. Right? So these, this, uh, this would be uh, like their cable modem kind of router. Right? Whatever, mo whatever router you are facing your service provider. Now your service provider is going to give you an IP address. Right. Now those IP address uh, um, would be whatever the service provider have in their pool. So you know, as we see here, ISP1 has the ability to offer addresses from 198.0.0.0 up to 198.255.255.0. So from this, uh, persons could get, or organizations could get, uh, for customer A, 198 at 8.3.0 slash 24. Customer B getting 198 at 4.2.0 slash 24 and 198 at 4.3.0 slash 24. Customer C getting 198 at 1.0.0 slash 24. Now, as you would see, all of these addresses are public IP addresses. So, these public IP addresses um, can be, are, are, well, these are more like a, a network. So, the IP addresses belonging to these networks are public IP addresses. An organization now could use these addresses and give them to individual devices in their network. Right? So, based on this, Using a slash 24, customer A actually has 254 addresses available. Okay? But usually, a customer of a service provider does not want to have so many public IP addresses because that's a cost. Okay? So, they typically would want to just have a single or maybe two public IP addresses. Now, having that few public IP address uh, means that for all of the devices in your organization, they will have to be private IP addresses. Since they are private IP addresses, the customer, as in customer A here, would end up with a problem because private IP addresses cannot go out to the internet. Right? All service providers are going to um, block private IP addresses. That now will bring us to the point of view of going to do network address translation. Because the network address translation now will uh, translate the private IP address within the organization to whatever public IP address they have gotten from the service provider. 
and that now would allow all devices to have access to the internet. That makes sense? So I. Okay. Alright, so let me get clear on when we when we go on. So these are all private IP addresses. Um 10.0.0.0 up to 10.255.255.255. So this is for the class A. And then we have 172.16.0.0 to 172.31.255.255 that's for class B and 172.192.168.0.0 up to 192.168.0.0 and then we have 172.168.0.0 to 172.168.0.0 so this is for class C now each of these ranges have uh, a certain number of networks so based on the class A1, it is really a single network. Just one network, just the network of 10. For the class B1, we actually get 16 networks. The networks are 172.16, and 172.17, and 172.18, and 172.19, and 18, right up to 172.31. 16 networks. For class C, we have 256 networks, which would be 192.168.0 and 192.168.1 and 192.168.2 and 192.168.3 and 192.168.4 and 192.168.2 all the way up to 192.168.255. So these are the networks. Now, the protocols we've been talking about are defined in RFCs. Okay. So there is an RFC um, uh, that defines how CIDR works. That is RFC 4632. There is one for NAT, which is RFC 3032. And one for private IP addressing, which is RFC 1918. Now, I want to draw your attention to the note at the bottom of the slide. Right, CIDR and NAT may be better known for their original RFCs 1518 and 1519 for CIDR and 1631 for NAT. So, when RFCs are written, from time to time they are updated. Right? But a RFC cannot change. That's the concept of RFC. When you write an RFC, once it is approved, it can never be changed. And so if there needs to be a change to the information contained in the RFC, a new RFC has to be created. So initially, uh, they would have done an RFC called 1518 that defines how CIDR works. Later, when they needed to make a change to the information, what they had to do is create a new RFC called 1519. And then much later, they needed to make a change again, so they had to create a new RFC called 4632. Look at that? Yes, sir. All right. Good. Sorry. Anything that right? Sorry. Say again. The CIDR is a classless domain router. Yeah, classless interdomain routing. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So here's how um not works. So we have this client in our organization with an IP address of 10.1.1.1. They need to communicate with a server on the internet that has an IP address of 170.1.1.1. .1 .1 .1. 
this 10.1.1.1 is a private IP address. So this IP address cannot exist anywhere on the internet. Therefore, our router needs to support that. So this is what's going to happen. So here is the packet that is generated by our client. It has a source IP address of 10.1.1.1, destination IP of 170.1.1.1. And then over here is going to be the data. Let me, let me get my pointer. Alright, so over here is the data. So when the client sends that packet, it goes comes to the NAT router. The NAT router is going to do the translation. So what the NAT router does is change the source IP from 10.1.1.1 to a different source, which is 200.1.1.1. Alright, so it is going to change it to usually the IP address that exists on the internet side of the router. So now, everywhere on the internet will believe the packet actually came from 200.1.1.1. Not making sense? Okay. So on the return now, so when the and Cisco server respond, Cisco server is going to set its IP, its own IP as a source, and then the destination is 200.1.1.1. So it's actually responding to this IP address here. Because Cisco server now doesn't know of the actual client that is on the inside. So this is the packet coming from the Cisco server. When it gets to the router, the router would have remembered from its um, NAT table that it had just not too long ago sent out a packet um, that it had to do a translation on. So based on that the memory table, it's going to then say, okay. Uh, the packet that I had received had a source IP of 10.1.1.1 so I must change this 200.1.1.1 to 10.1.1.1.1 and therefore allow the packet to get to the correct client on the inside that makes sense right? Yes, yes. Alright, Alright, so let's look at um, a little more detail. Um, in fact, you know, before I use this slide, I think it is better if we come down to this slide here. I'll go back up, but I believe this slide it is it serves us better if we look at this slide first. So when it comes to NAT, there are some terms that we should know, right? The terms are inside local, inside global, outside global, outside local. So notice we have two terms, two or two words in the term. Right? The first word is going to be either inside or outside. And then the second word is going to be either local or global. So in, in defining these terms, we are going to use it based on these words, right? the first and the second. The first word identifies the permanent location of the device, or the actual physical location of the device. That's, that's what this is saying. So inside here is saying this is inside our private network. That's what this first one means. Right? So it is telling us where the device actually exists. Then the second word is being used to identify the IP address based on where 
it is starting from. Right? So the first one is the physical location. Second one is identifying the IP address based on where it is starting from. So if you look at the first one, inside, so it's saying the device is inside. It is inside our organization or inside our private network. And the second one, local, this traffic is starting from or originating or, or currently existing, right, any one of those, in our local network. That makes sense so far? Yes. Right. Now, um, as this packet traverse the network, at some point it's going to have to get to the NAT route and then be translated. At that point, we get to here. It is still considered inside because the device that originated the packet is still inside that device. That is the permanent location of the device inside. However, the IP address is no longer a local IP address from inside our organization. The IP address has been translated to an IP address that exists on the outside. So the, the, the IP address is now considered to be global because it's an IP address that is um, on the outside of our organization. It's an IP address that belongs to the global internet. Make sense? Yes. Yeah. So we have inside local, inside global. Um, inside local is the IP address before translation. Inside global is the IP address after translation. Then looking at these two now, outside global and outside local. So in this case, outside is referring to the permanent location of the device. So this then would be the server that is outside of our network. So this would be the Cisco server. Right? So it is outside. Right? That Cisco server has an IP address that is global. It has a public IP address. So the outside global is going to represent the IP address of the device on the outside of the network. Right? Yes. And then we have outside local. Now, for the type of NAT that we are required to learn in CCNA, outside local is something we would never meet upon. For the CCNA level, you will not see anything that deals with outside local. But I'll explain it for you so that you get an idea of what it is. But bear in mind, you won't see this in, in CCNA level. So, when we do NAT at the CCNA level, the NAT is for traffic that is originating inside our network and going out. Right? So the source is always the inside. However, we could also do NAT where we are doing NAT for traffic that originate from outside of our network and coming in. That kind of NAT is for when you do things. You've heard the term port forwarding? Yes, yes. Right. So if we're doing port forwarding on a Cisco router, this is the time we would we would do a translation for traffic coming from outside and coming in. Right? Now, CCNA doesn't look at that scenario. Now, in that case, um, since the traffic coming from outside, the device where it's originating from will always be on the outside. But when that traffic gets in, the, it would have, the IP address would have been translated to an IP address that fits our local network on the inside. So outside local 
would be the IP address of a device that exists on the outside, but the IP address is as it is used when the traffic gets on the inside. That makes sense? Yes. Right. <coughs> Sorry. So, but bear in mind, as I said, this is not a part of CCNA. So yeah. you, know, you won't you won't see this, and hence why um, for the type of NAT we are doing, you notice just enough of a dash here because you will not in your NAT tables you will not see any entries here because for what we are doing, this section of the table will not be populated. Right. So oh, I needed to go back up. So let's go back up now and use this what we have so we're looking at static NAT um, inside local and inside global so now we know exactly what we are talking about when we say inside local and inside global okay. so that is why I, I, I went to that slide first because these wouldn't have made much sense to us until we saw those terminologies so here's our network 10.1.1.1, 10.1.1.2, we are the devices inside our network. This is our router that is doing the NAT, and we are communicating with some device somewhere on the internet that has an IP address of 170.1.1.1. These addresses on the inside here are going to be our inside local it is the IP address of the device as it is on the inside of our network. These addresses over here for the server are the um, outside global, right? which is the IP address of the device that are on, or on the outside of our network. So this IP address is the outside global. Alright, so you, you okay with those two so far? Yes, yes. Right, so inside local, outside global. Now, for the 10.1.1, and it could be 10.1.1.2, so whichever one of them. So in this case, 10.1.1.1 sends the data. That needs to be translated to a public IP address. When it is translated, this new address becomes our inside global. So it's the global address that is representing the device that is inside our network. Good? Right. So that's, that explains this diagram here. Right. So the, the two diagrams, um, this one and this one, is the same thing. It's just that the difference is that initially they use the term private address, public address, right here, and they didn't label the network as inside and outside. From here, they just put on those labels to make it easier to understand. So, same network. So, I would have gone through the explanation already. And we saw this already. So, looking at dynamic NAT. So, we just talked about static NAT, right? And we're moving on to dynamic NAT. But I, I don't think I, I did explain exactly what is static NAT. So, when we're doing network address translation, we have three options we have static NAT, dynamic NAT, and then we have Port address translation, shortened for PAT. That last one, port address translation, Cisco calls it overloading. So, with static NAT, what we have is one IP address on the inside being mapped to one IP address on the outside. But 
it is a manual process so as the administrator you have to map each one you have to take each IP address on the inside and map it to an IP address on the outside and if it's 50 of them you have to type in those 50 mappings with static NAT so static NAT is usually used when you have only a small number of IP addresses that you want to do an inside to outside mapping with with me so far? Yes, yes. Right. So dynamic knotting is still where you have one IP address on the inside to be mapped to one IP address on the outside. The big difference here is if you have a large number, like 50, you don't have to do them one by one. You don't have to do the first mapping, then go to the second mapping. What you do is put them in pools. So the inside set, you put that inside, so you put all 50 of them in an inside pool. And then the, for the outside addresses, you put all of them in an outside pool. And so you simply map the pool. So you say, my inside pool is mapped to my outside pool. And so, you, so in terms of what you'll be doing, you do it once. You're just mapping pools. And, and, and the router now would pick individual IP addresses to map. That makes sense? Yes. Okay, good, good. So, notice we're using the same network, right? And then we have a NAT table. So, um, in this case, the NAT table is going to be empty because all we would have set up is a pool and says my inside pool must be mapped to my outside pool. Since no traffic has passed as yet, then the router has not yet done any mapping. The router just knows that I should map inside pool to outside pool. So the very first time one of the computers sends something which is down here, then the computer would have said, okay, you are 10.1.1.1. That one, that one, that one. I'm going to just match it to one of the IP addresses in my outside pool. And it matches it to 200.1.1.1. That one, that one, that one. Now the router have, option, have the option of picking any address in the, in the outside pool. Right? But typically it starts with the first one. And notice as we have here, so this is our outside pool. So we just create this outside pool. And, and we'll put all of the inside ones in a pool as well. And we're just mapping the pool. Make sense? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So what you're looking at is um, what would happen now if we have um, several of the devices trying to communicate now that we have these pools set up inside pool and our outside pool so we have 10.1.1.1 .1 .1 .1 .1 wanting to communicate with the server so 10.1.1.1 .1 .1 is using its source port of 10.24 and it communicates with the server that is outside uh, the server is using port 80 then we have um, the second computer using IP address 10.1.1.2 .1 .1 it chooses its own port as well source port of 10.24 and it's communicating with the server um, same IP address and port for the server we have a third computer using IP address 10.1.1.3 uh, it chooses a local port of 10.33 and it's communicating with the same server. Now, bear in mind that every communication needs to be unique. And the question might come up as to whether or not this is indicating three unique communication. And the answer is yes. Because when we try to figure out if our communication is unique, we have to look at um, and I'm going to bring my notepad in view to show you the things that we look at to determine if a communication is unique. Um, we don't want to do that. Alright. 
So I'm going to, I can delete this information that is here. So when we try to determine if a communication is unique, right, we look at the source, and I'm just going to use SRC for source. Source IP address. That's one of the things. Then we look at source port. We look at destination IP address. Then we look at destination port. Then we look at protocol. Right. So if any one of these differ, then the communication is unique. Right? So um, my 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 mouse is double picking when I don't want it to double. So let's keep these in view right here. And we're going to walk through these three communication and see and, and verify that they are unique. So the first one has a source IP of 10.1.1.1, a source port of 10.24, destination IP of 170.1.1.1, destination port of 80, and of course, because we see 80 here, then we know the, the protocol is going to be HTTP. Look at that. Yes. All right. So let's look at the second one now. Source IP 1.1.1.2. So we see that the source IP address has changed. So that makes it unique because at least one of the five things differ. With me? That makes sense, Andrew. Yes, yes, yes. Right. Now we can see that the rest of the there are four things. The the source port, um the destination IP and the destination port. Right? All of these they are they are the same as the first communication and, and the protocol. Right? So the only thing that changes is the source IP. But, as you say, as long as one thing change, then the, the communication is considered unique. Right? And that's what we need. Every communication must be unique. So let's look at the third one. Source IP 10.1.1.3, which again, our source IP address has changed. So that would make it unique. Note also that our source port has changed, so and we have two things that have changed. The last three have not changed. The destination IP, the destination port, and the protocol has not changed. All right. Yes. All right. So the key thing is. We need to, for, for, for the communication to take place, every one of them need to be unique. Alright, so here's another case. I'm going to bring back my, keep my notepad in view while we talk about this. So we have source IP. So, um, but it's not another case. I, I, I shouldn't have said another case. It is the translation. Let's, let's go back. So this is what we had. And then the next slide is showing us the translation that, that will take place with this. So this is the translation. Right? So I'm going to be switching between the two slides. Right? Let's start with the first communication. 10.1.1.1 is the source IP. This source IP is going to be translated, going, going to the next slide, translated to 200.1.1.2. Are we clear that? Yeah, yeah. Alright. So let's go back up. The port 1024 
So we go back down. We had not translated the port. Right? The source port. So the source IP address was translated, but not the source port. Now we usually don't do anything to the destination. Nothing is changed on the destination. So the destination IP and the destination port remains the same. Now let's go back to our previous slide. Let's look at now at the second communication. 10.1.1.2 using 10.24. Okay. Now let's look at the translation. So the IP address is translated to 200.1.1.2, but notice we have also translated the port, right? Because the port was originally 1024. You see that? Yeah, yeah. Right. So the reason why we had to do that is if we had kept the same port then the communication would no longer be unique. Right? On the outside of the network, the communication would no longer be unique. Right? If we had kept this step to 1024. When you look at it, you'll see everything is, is would have been the same. You see it? Yes. Right. Now this brings us to the what we talked about the port address translation right so if we're using just pure NAT then we would not have been able to do this this the second communication would have failed right it would not have been able to take place because the the router would have seen it as a new communication being generated but it is not unique and, and therefore would not be able to complete that communication so in order to allow several communication to take place using a single IP address to be translated to, then we have to now use port address translation. So instead of, instead of using NAT, we have to use PAT, right? port address translation. This is what Cisco calls overloaded. So the generic term is port address translation, but Cisco calls it overloaded. Let's look at our third communication. 10.1.1.3 using a source port of 10.23, sorry, of 10.33. Let's look at what happens here. Notice what it does here. It translated the IP and it translated the port. Now, it really did not need to translate the port because the port was already unique. However, depending on which router you're using, uh, some routers like to ensure that they keep the port numbers sequential, so the, it would uh, it uh, would translate the port. But it, it it is not a requirement to translate the port if the port would already be unique. With me? Yes. Okay. So. That, as I was indicating, is bringing us into port address translation. So without using port address translation, these communications would fail. We would never be able to complete them. At least the second one here would fail. So port address translation is what allowed that to work. And that's what we're seeing here. So we've just actually talked about port address translation. So the key thing here is that with port address translation, we are not only translating the IP address, but we are translating the port numbers as well. Good? Now, the, the, in terms of Cisco, Cisco configures dynamic NAT the same way 
uh, they configure port, um, configure overloading. And, and that is why, um, in terms of a description, it, is, it says dynamic NAT with overloading. Right? So the term overloading is just saying we have the ability to overload the IP address. That's, that's the concept from Cisco. see what we have here. So this is uh, another network showing us now we could use static NAT. So we have uh, two clients. Um, this is our NAT router. Those clients would like to get to the server of 170.1.1.1. .1 .1 .1. um, So when when let's take the first one, ten dot one dot one dot one, um would like to communicate to the server. So what's going to happen as the packet reaches the router, the ten dot one dot one dot one is going to be translated to two hundred dot one dot one dot one, which is an IP address that fits the public side. Now, a, a key thing that is brought out in this diagram is that this IP address that we are using in the translation does not have to be the IP address that is on the external port. In most cases, it is, but it does not have to be. It just simply needs to be an IP address that is in the range of this outside port must be something that is in the range, but it does not have to be the exact IP address that is on the port. And it must be an IP address that you paid for. You can't just pick an IP address and use one, because you might be using something that somebody else has paid for. You think? Yes. Okay. Right, so here we're looking at how we actually do the configuration. So this configuration has been done and we're using the show run to see what it will look like. So um, I'm going to start from down, from down here because typically this is the part that we will do first. The order really does not matter, right? The order in which you do the configuration it doesn't matter. But in most cases, when we are doing a NAT configuration, this is the section we start from first. And this section we are surfing with my mouse. So, I'm going to start from there. So we say IP NAT inside source. Now remember I was telling you that um, only a certain uh, kind of NAT is supported at the CNA, uh, not supported, is covered at the CCNA level. And that, that's this one, inside source. So CCNA only cover inside source. Yeah. Which is saying the source is originating from inside. <laughs> so, just so that you know, this we could as a as a general knowledge of not. <laughs> Other things that are supported are things like inside destination, right? So we should say the destination host is the one on the inside. We could have an outside source, which is saying this the device on the outside is where things will begin from, and we could have outside destination. Right? So those are four different. There are four options we have for NAT. Inside source, inside destination, outside source, outside destination. But bear in mind, CCNA only covers inside source. So this is the only one you need to know. Cool? Alright, so... This is how we would normally do it, and this is for static NAT. So we say inside, in, sorry, IP NAT, 
inside source so we're saying we are configuring this for traffic starting from the inside of our network static because we're doing static not and we say 10.1.1.2 as the inside IP address and then we put the outside IP address that it must map to 200.1.1.2 so this is one NAT translation then if we want a second one so we have, that, we have another PC we say IP NAT inside source static 10.1.1.1 and then the outside IP address it must map to 200.1.1.1.1 so if we had 50 inside computers we'd have to have 50 lines so we'd have another IP NAT inside source static 10.1.1.1 sorry 10.1.1.3 map to 200.1.1.3 and so on and so on and so on so you see, for static, it's a lot of work if you have a whole lot of computers. You see that, right? Uh, yeah. Right. So static NAT is recommended only if you have a few addresses that you need to translate. Alright, so once you've set up this part, the next thing you need to do now is to tell your router which of the interfaces it must consider to be inside and which one to be considered as outside. So in this case, our gigabit Ethernet series class 0 is the one we want to be inside. So on that interface, we type the command IP not inside. And then our serial interface is the one we want to consider to be outside. So this is the one going to the internet. Right, the one going to the internet is always the one outside. So we say IP not outside on that interface. So our, our, our router knows now that it's going to be translating things that exist on this part of the network to things that are on this part of the network. With me? Yes. Alright, so the, the next command that we could do is show IP not translations. So once we've set this up, we have, we have manually built the translation table. So once we set this up and type show IP not translation, we will see this output here. So the, the output is kind of set back way. Right, so this over here is our um, inside global and these are our inside local. Inside global right here and over here inside local. Cool? Yeah, yeah. And then we could do you now show IP not statistics and it tells us that total active translations two and two of them are static. So in other words, we only have static translations. And down here, the hits means that hits means how many times the translation has been used. And that's what hits mean how many times the translation has been used. So um, we, we know from this that they, on, on this router that they did the NAT, they would have sent some, some amount of traffic so that it had been used 100 times. Good? Yeah, yeah. So here is how we will do dynamic NAT now. So we have just looked at how static NAT is configured. So we make dynamic NAT. Again, as I said, I want to start down here because this is typically what we would do first. But the order doesn't matter. Yeah, that's one of the good things about NAT. We can do anything first. We can do it in any order. It, it doesn't matter. But normally, this is where we start from. So I'm going to start here, go down, and then do this to the top part after. 
So we say IP not pool Fred. So what we're saying here is we're setting up not. We're going to be creating a pool. We're giving the pool a name Fred. Okay? So IP not pool Fred. We're creating not. We're setting up a pool. We're calling the pool Fred. And then over here now we tell what exactly should be in the pool. So we list the IP addresses that are in the pool. So 200.1.1.1, 200.1.1.2. So this is the start of the pool, end of the pool. Get that so far? Okay. Right. Remember, I said now with dynamic not what we're we doing is mapping the inside pool to the outside pool, right? right? So this line here is where we're creating our our outside pool. So this is how we create the outside pool. IP not pool Fred and Fred is just the name don't have to exist anywhere. You just pick a name. It could be anything. So you just need to pick a name. The name don't have to exist before. So IP not pool Fred. Start of the pool, end of the pool. And then we indicate the subnet mask that covers these two addresses. I want to say that again, right? Is not the subnet mask of the address. Like all oh, these are class C, so it's not the class C um, subnet mask. It's a subnet mask that covers the range that these pool are in. So I'm going to bring up my notepad to, to kind of clarify that. So So we have 200.1.1.1 and we have 200.1.1.2. So these are two addresses. Um, if we use 255.255.255.252, what this means, looking at the 252 section of the subnet mask, right? So just taking this section of the subnet mask and converting it to binary. It is really 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 2. So that is, this is what 252 amounts to. Right? So what we have is 6 ones and 2 zeros. Zeros represents the host section. These IP addresses are the actual host IP addresses. So this, these zeros, we have two zeros here. And remember, when we get the host section, we say two raised to the power of the number of zeros. And in this case, the number of zeros is two. So the first two here is because it is binary. And then raise to the power of 2 because we have two zeros. And then because it's mostly calculating, we must subtract 2. So this is going to give us 2. 2 to the power of 2 gives us 4. And then 4 minus 2 gives us 2. Make sense? Yeah, sure. Right. So that is why we would use this subnet mask because that says only two addresses are being considered in the pool. With me? Yeah, yeah. Now I, I want to emphasize, and uh, it might sound like I'm belaboring um, the, the point, uh, belaboring the point, but it's, it's extremely important. And I'm going to show you why, why, just, just go a little further. Let's say we had two more IP addresses, 200.1.1.3, uh, 200.1.1.2, and 
and we had 200 dot one dot one dot well I missed that there but um let's say four yeah let's just make it like this so 200 dot one dot one dot three 200 dot one dot one dot four we have these additional two IP addresses in there and we had gone ahead and used this same subnet mask what would happen is that these last two IP address there would never be any translation going to them because when NAT looks at the, the, the mask that we have it's going to say okay so based on the first one this can only cover two so it's only going to cover these first two and it would never translate anything to these latter two. So even though we have them in the pool, mm -hmm. it would there would never be any translation going to them. Okay. Right. Make sense? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So if we had all of these, then what we'd have to do is use a different subnet mask here. So we'd have to I uh, use something now like maybe uh, say 248 right 248 is going to amount to five ones and three zeros which would if we work this out now give us two raised to the third power and then minus two and that would equal to so 2 raised to the third power is 8 minus 2 give us 6 so that would cover 6 addresses which would be from 1 to 6 right even though we don't have um, 5 and 6 inside of this but this would cover from 1 to 6 so we would have the option of if we can purchase the other two we could purchase them and use them in our pool mm. yeah. now there is a problem with this right um, they, they usually recommend that you don't set a, a, a subnet mask that cover IP addresses that you don't have so like in our case here this is covering addresses that we don't have right? We don't have uh, three and four. Sorry, we don't have um, five and six. I'm assuming that we had three and four. So it would have been better if we use a, a different subnet mask that cover specifically the three and the four. So, so in other words, what I'm saying is we should have we would have two lines of IP not pool. So one line would cover these two and then we have another line that cover the other two that we want to use with me yeah yeah all right so that's our outside pool so we have completed the discussion on how we create our outside pool so IP not pool give it a name you just pick a name the starting of the pool the ending of the pool and we choose we say net mask and we choose a mask that actually covers the pool then next this section now is how we set up our inside pool so for the inside pool we say IP not inside source right and then this over here is an access list Right, so we pick an access list. So we'd have to pick an access list that is not already being used. Right? So IP in, IP not inside source list one or whatever number we choose, pool friend. So this is saying our inside source is being defined by access list one and it is being mapped to a outside pool called Fred. See that? Yeah. Right. 
So now, what we would do now is use is then go and take the access list to define the, the IP addresses. So we are defining what IP addresses are in this pool called list one. Right? List one is really the access list, but access list is being used to create the pool. So down here now we say access list one permit 10.1.1.2 Next entry in the access list, access list 1, permit 10.1.1.1. So now we are saying these two addresses belong to this pool called list 1. And list 1 is our inside pool, because we said inside source, right? Our inside source is this one. It's being mapped to a pool called Fred, which is on the outside. Cool? Yeah, yeah. Right. Now, similar to what we were saying about the net mask here, to make sure it covers the, the, the right set of addresses, we have to do the same thing here, right? So, for example, if we Let's say we had forgotten to put in the second line, access this one permit 10.1.1.1. Even though 10.1.1.1 belongs to the same network that is being translated, it would never be translated because we did not include it by saying access this one permit 10.1.1.1. Okay? Yeah, yeah. Right. So that's um just some little pointers that we have to make sure we look out for when we're doing access list. Because that's one of the issues that usually happen. You find um some some users can get onto the internet and some can't. And usually that is the case because in the so in the inside source some of the users were not included in the access list. So, just have to be careful about that part. Okay. Yeah. All right. So that and, and and then now we go back to the interfaces now, and we choose which interface need to be inside and which need to be outside, and that would have covered dynamic NAT. So, um. It's it's much easier to do dynamic NAT when you have a large number. Right. And and in fact the, what they have done here with the inside source is really um it, it could have been done shorter. I'm going to show you. Um as the the this and this it the it, it appears as if you would have to do a one line for every IP address on the inside, which is not so. So I'm going to show you what could have been done with this to make it easy okay, using Notepad. So I said access this one. Permit ten dot one dot one dot one space zero dot zero dot zero dot three. Uh, I see maybe three. Um, no, I would say three. Yeah, three is two five. Yeah. So this would cover. Um, this would cover these two addresses. And yeah, yeah, yeah. And and so you'd have just done one line, and you cover your two addresses. So. Basically, is is the subnet mask? Remember, remember what that would have done. Subnet mask versus um um yeah. 
they they what to call it again? Um, like the names between the I'm going to say inverse mask. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Right, which you either subtract it from all two five fives. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. So this now would have made life easier. So if we had a if we had a case where it was let's say six IP addresses inside here, then we could easily just say say uh, seven here, which is taking away two four eight from two five five. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so usually one line you can do one line to cover all your internal addresses. All right. So that's dynamic knot. All right. So having completed that, then we can do show IP in our translations. Notice now, you see. There's nothing in show IP in our translations because the the mapping will only happen after somebody has sent the traffic. Okay. Yeah. While with the static one, from the moment we set it up, there's a mapping because it is manually sent. Okay. This one now. There's no mapping until somebody sends some traffic. All right. Show IP not statistics. Um, no traffic has been sent as yet, so everything is going to be zero. Um, this now is after somebody sent something. So here is the, the mapping, right? This is after somebody has sent one packet or a number of packets. So we see. So we know 10.1.1.1 is the device that has sent some traffic. So we have our inside global, inside local. Um, total, total active translation, one, as in there is only one mapping. If, if one of the other computer had sent, then we would get an, another line and we would have two mappings. Tells us that it's dynamic. And 69 hits, one miss. So what this is saying, 69 packets were translated. And there was one packet that was sent that did not go through the translation. It, it, it went through the router, but it is it did not use this translation. Cool. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. So, um. This, this part is showing us now how if we wanted to clear the translation out of the router, right? Because we have a translation there. This is how we do it. Clear IP not translations. So this will move every translation that is in the router. Um, let me, I want to rephrase that. Every dynamic translation that is in the router. So any static mapping would not be removed. Only and that is where it learned by itself. Yeah, based on based on we doing um, this com this set of commands. Yeah, 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 yeah. If we did this set of commands, then it would have been static. Mm -hmm. Right. So when we use the uh, when we use this command, clear IP not translations asterisk. Most of the asterisk, right? So clear IP not translation asterisk. This will remove all dynamic mappings, but it does not remove static mappings.
So the reason that we had done this part, removing the translation, was to demonstrate that when we use a different computer, because remember we start to go to 10.1.1.1. So we clear the mappings and we use 10.1.1.2. Notice it still uses the first IP address in the outside pool. Because the router will always just go to the first address in the pool if it is free. With me? Yeah, it does. Now, if you want to see the mapping as it is happening, so you're sending traffic through the router and you want to see each packet as it is being sent through the router, then this is where you need to debug. Say so you are debug IP NAT and then send your traffic and you would see the, the, the mapping of each traffic as it is going through the router. So let's take a look at one of the lines now. So first of all, we get the date and time. Okay. Then it tells us that we're using NAT. The S here means the source. So the source IP is 10.1.1.1. And the, the arrow here tells us the mapping. It is being mapped to 200.1.1.2. The actual destination that the packet is going to on the outside is 170.1.1.1. Right. Um, um, I believe this is the sequence number of the, the packets. And then um, this now is the return, so this is when the server responds. So again, we start with the date and time, it tells us we're using that. And um, the source now is the server, 170.1.1.1. Destination, so the server doesn't know anything about the inside client, so the server is really responding to the um, outside, the inside global address, which is 200.1.1.2. And notice it is being mapped to 10.1.1.1. So it's translated. So this is the sequence. So it, the sequence is identifying the, the communication uh, in terms of numbers. So each, each, each communication that goes through is numbered. The first one, the second one. Right? So this is the first one. And then the second one is, is well, in, I'm saying second, but it, this is the 248 one, and this is the 249 one. With me? Yeah. Okay. All right. So this now is looking at PAT, which is the port overloading. So. Um, very similar to dynamic NAT, so the, the diagram is the same. Right? Um, everything is going to work the same. Uh, we, we already looked at this section here about the mapping of the port numbers. Right? So what I want to do is just to take it to the configuration, and because uh, that's where the difference really is. So notice this is the only difference. Everything else is going to be the same, and that is why we have only highlighted this line. So, right. So, IP not inside source, list one, and you know, you understand what this part is doing already, right? Mm, yeah, right? yeah. So, this is identifying the inside pool. So, IP not inside source, list one, and then we simply say, interface serial 0 slash 0 slash 0 so we are identifying the interface that we want to use the IP address from so we are using the IP address that is on this interface so whatever it is right, we are using that IP address and then we say overload and that's it 
The rest of it is the same as what we would have done with Dynamic Knot, where we would have used the access list to define the inside tool. Now, there's another way we could have done this. We could have identified the outside pool as well. So, I'm going to go back up and show you something. Right here. So, remember when we looked at dynamic knot, we said IP knot pool thread. Right? And then we, we identified the start and the end and the mask. Uh, you remember that, right? Yeah, yeah. Now we could have done this same thing for 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 overloading, and then on this line here is where we make the difference. And we would have typed it the same way, but at the end here we would just put the word overload, and that would have changed it. Just that alone would have changed it. With me? Yeah, yeah. Right. So uh, that is why we typically say dynamic not with overload because um, all we do is on this line we simply add the word overload at the end and, and that changes it. It, it. Once you put the word overload here it means we should translate, the router should translate ports as well as IP addresses. Uh, yeah. <coughs> Alright, so I believe that should take us to the end. Um, so we have the troubleshooting section. Um, yeah. Alright, so in terms of troubleshooting, there is, this is just really telling you the areas that you need to look, look out for when you're doing troubleshooting. Okay. Um, this is a common one as well. Persons often reverse the inside and the outside. So in in the configuration, um, I'm going back up. Like right here, persons make the mistake of putting the inside addresses right here, and then put the outside addresses here. Okay. So they, they just reverse them. So when you're troubleshooting, that's something you look out for to see if, if when it was being configured, somebody um, reversed the, the, the things. Also, look if, if, the, if static NAT is being used, because sometimes the persons really wanted dynamic NAT in, but they they, they didn't know how to do it and they end up configured on the static map. Um, if dynamic NAT is used, you can pay attention to the access list. Because remember the access list is defining the internal pool. So if that is not done correctly. And I, I was mentioning it as well, that you could actually have a case where some of the addresses are left out of the pool because of the the incorrect um, mask using the access list. Okay. And the same thing for the, the the pool, which is for the outside, which I had shown you as well, where based on the mask you use, you could actually not include some of the addresses in the outside pool. Remember? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And if you're using overloading, right, somebody might have said configure path. So you might not be the one doing the configuration, another engineer doing the configuration. And he or she was told to do path. But when they're looking in the router, they don't see anything called path. So they end up on just do a dynamic not configuration. The problem with that is that they would not have included the word overloading. Okay. Right. So, if his part is to be used, then you want to look out to see if the word overloading was actually used in the command. Cool? Yeah, yeah. Right. 
And of course, we talked about the access and severity. Mm -hmm. Is the traffic required? Um, in some cases, the NAT can be set up to pass on the specific type of traffic, and therefore, um, some traffic will be blocked. Also, NAT doesn't work well with things like voice over IP or video. So those are the user traffic. So if persons, they say it come to a case and some people are having problems, then questions you want to find out is those who are having problems, what kind of traffic are they they're using? Is it just normal data or is it video? Is it voice over IP? And that could give you get you an idea as to where the problem could be. Okay. Because not not doesn't work well with with um, voice over IP. They have put on some extensions that allows it to work better with voice over IP and video. But um, who knows? You might be working with an older router that don't have those extensions. Oh, yeah. yeah. And the other part is routing. Routing will always impact everything, so you have to check your routing team. Right. Yeah. Okay. I think that's the end of this slide. Yeah. And I think we are we are eleven minutes past five, so um, we are at the end of our session for today. So, right. so we have these others now um, that mm -hmm. we need to cover. Uh, so on your own you go through these. Now uh, when for next week I guess we can decide next week or you can decide next week what you want to do. If you want us to go through what is in module seven or we target what is the, the, the rest of what is in module six. Okay, yeah. I will not show all of them. Yeah. Uh, what I do is go through your slides mm -hmm. and then we'll go ahead. Yeah, and and then you can tell me where you want us to target. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. So many thanks for your participation today. Right, you're welcome. All right. And uh, if not before, we'll talk next week. Yes. Yeah. All right. Take care. Okay. You too.